We're glad to have another op opportunity for an interview with an international comrade and I'm sitting here with Bonnie from London and she will tell us a bit about the anarchist movement and the social situation in the United Kingdom right now. So maybe let's start with you telling us which group you are here with and why you think it's important to attend this international meeting. So I'm from the anarchist communist group and we're a small uh, anarchist group in Great Britain. We're located in different parts, Scotland, Wales, and England. Um, we're anarchist communists, so we, be we believe that uh, it's important to be organized as a specific anarchist communist organization, but we also believe it's very important to be involved in social struggle. And we see ourselves as class struggle anarchists, revolutionary class struggle anarchists. And uh, so we've been, some of us have been active in anarchism for many decades. Um, we've been to a number of international meetings in the past. Um, we were at saint Omer 13 years ago, in 2012, um, because at that point we were in the Anarchist Federation, which was part of the International of Anarchist Federations. Mm -hmm. And we had been with them for quite a few years. So when we come to these gatherings, we feel we are reconnecting with comrades that we have known for a long time. And uh, we think this continuity is important. So, I mean, we're good f friends with the Italians, the French, the Slovenians, Croatians. And uh, so that's one of the reasons for coming is to uh, catch up with people and uh, find out what's going on. Um, we also, there's probably two reasons for coming to an event like this. One is to try to learn what's going on in other people's countries and to exchange ideas. But of course, we have a very specific version of anarchism, which is probably a minority view. Mm. And therefore, we come to these things also to present our ideas. I mean, through our sales of the things that we produce. And uh, this time we haven't really done, you know, we've given one meeting. And uh, one of us also spoke at the Italian Anarchist Federation meeting uh, against the war. Because that's the other thing that we find is that we have, we share the Italian's position on the war in Ukraine, which also is a divisive issue in the anarchist movement. So we come partially to give our ideas over, spread our ideas to others, but also to learn from others and see what's going on, as well as, I said, connecting with old comrades and meeting new ones. I think these are reasons that a lot of people um, have here for attending the international meeting. It's really interesting. And now I would like to know about the status and also the situation the anarchist movement in the United Kingdom is in right now because, at least from a German point of view, I think a lot of you also share this view, um, the anarchist movement in Great Britain seems like really diverse, some would even maybe say splintered between a <laughs> lot of different groups. So maybe you can tell us about the situation, what kinds of groups are there, and maybe also if there are like um, <laughs> ideas of federation, or maybe even right now um, groups that are already federated in larger bodies. Right, so the anarchist movement in Great Britain is very small. And uh, unfortunately, uh, great politics is dominated by Leninist groups. Mm. So we find ourselves, the first organization many people come across is these Leninist or Trotskyist groups. And I don't think it's the same problem elsewhere. So, mm. so really, the anarchist movement itself is quite small. Um, the other, again, this is my view, so obviously other people have different views. Um, many, most people, and I don't even know if we call it an anarchist movement. We call it often an anarchist scene, yeah. which is social, mm. people hanging around together, um, people are involved in small projects or whatever. But there's very few who seem to believe in organized anarchism, 
which is another reason why we like coming here is because we can meet up with all our international comrades who actually share our views because sometimes we feel that we're, we're in a minority. So people think that, I mean, even anarchists we work with quite well in London don't seem to want to join a national organization. They will just want to do something local. So mm -hmm. they'll have a local group. Even if what they do locally is very good, there's not this, uh, this aim of actually coming together on a national level. So there's always that problem. And uh, we often find that we will go to things like uh, demonstrations or protests, and we're almost the only ones. And you're thinking, there's all these anarchists, but where are they? <laughs> you know, and even at things like Kill the Bill, you know, or something that is a bit more radical, we find our XR, you know, the environmental movements, we find that people, it's almost like the, the anarchism exists on, on, in cyberspace or in, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So we're a bit frustrated with that. Um, the other issue, of course, is that there, I would say there's a bit of a split between it's a stereotype and a generalization, but what we would call identity politics and class struggle politics. And uh, it's, I often don't like to make that criticism because it implies that you know we were, were we don't think fighting oppression is in not we think it's mm -hmm. not important. We do think it's important, but the problem is, is people have gotten so sucked in to their own particular identity that they no longer see themselves as a class. So they don't come together with others. They don't have the, a vision of coming to, together with others. And obviously, if you're groups like Black Lives Matter, they want to organize autonomous, autonomously, which is quite understandable. But it's still, if we are going to have a revolution, then we, people need to see themselves as part of a working class movement, working class broadly defined, shall we say, to include the unemployed, etc. Um, so I suppose we're in a bit of minority on that, that we tend to focus on issues that we think will bring people together, like the cost of living that everyone's affected by. Obviously, we support um, campaigns against police violence and things like that. So I suppose we think there's a bit of a division in the anarchist uh, movement between people focused on those sorts of things and people who might be fo focused more on single issue to do with a particular identity. Um, but there are loads of people who might not even call themselves anarchists who are involved in stuff. Yeah. And uh, so this is often where we will find ourselves. I mean, one thing I've been very interested in is the whole food and growing movement, the housing movement. And there's, I've worked with loads of people, and to me it doesn't really matter whether they call themselves anarchists or not. In fact, I often find them more anarchist sometimes than the anarchists. And, uh, and you, you know, much broader groups of working class people and communities who have come together. And the other area, of course, is all the various workplace struggles that our members are involved in as well. And there are good groups there. There's the, some, you know, there's the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World. There's also some other really good radical unions. One of them is called the United Voices of the World in London who organize, they started organizing mainly a migrant Latin American cleaners, but have mm -hmm. spread out to other precarious workers and even other workers. And uh, they've managed to really win some important victories. So there's these really positive initiatives going on, but I wouldn't say they're part of the anarchist movement, but I suppose we see ourselves as we're a specific anarchist communist organization but it's these struggles that we need to be involved in, and these are the people we want to work with and focus on. I mean, that's really interesting because I think a lot of the issues you, are, you have discussed right now are pretty similar to what we see in Germany, um, more of an anarchist scene than a movement, and also, like, sometimes you see more anarchist politics in, like, grassroots movement coming out of the society than from the scene itself. But um, also, it's really interesting uh, that you mentioned the uh, Trotskyist groups in Great Britain because there are a lot of German Trotskyist groups that um, also came out of the splits of um, British groups. So when the mother organization in Great Britain is splitting up itself, the German groups are also doing the same. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, pretty funny. That. 
But I mean, um, you also touched on uh, different movements right now in UK and um, cost of living, unionization. So maybe we can also talk a bit about the social situation the United Kingdom is in right now, because I mean, there were a lot of changes. Uh, we also discussed in a podcast episode the coronation of Charles mm -hmm. and um, monarchy today. So for all the German speaking folks out there, um, listen to this episode. Uh, I think it's episode 102. Um, but there are also a lot of other pretty um, even more important issues like the housing crisis and cost of living crisis. So maybe even if it's uh, probably not that much of an involvement, you can touch on yeah. like how anarchists are reacting to this and what kind of initiatives are there. Yeah. So I mean, for the obviously for the cost of living crisis, um, it's a uh, primarily dominated by mainstream trade unions, but there are anarchists who work in education, for example, or post office, who are in these mainstream uh, trade unions. And uh, we do think that if that's the main form of organization where you're working, that you have to be part of that, despite it's the limitations. So I think uh, anarchists have been involved in those struggles. In fact, I talked to someone here from Wales, who was very involved in the, the, the education struggles um, as well, and so people are involved in that at the grassroots and the in the cost and the strikes for higher pay. But it's not just about higher pay; it's also about conditions and a general attack on the working class. And pensions is another key issue that people are worried about. So there's all that going on. Um, there were some campaigns, for example, from a group that are not explicitly anarchist, though there's anarchist in them that we work with called Plan C. And uh, they started, well, they helped start a campaign about don't pay, can't pay, won't pay, something like that, about the energy in prices. Mm. But um, it's hard to say what happened, but it didn't really take off in the end because the government quite soon actually started giving out sort of subsidies to people. So that particular, I mean, it started as a campaign of people refusing to pay energy bills, but in the end, that it hasn't really gone very far, that particular campaign. So, so cost of living issues. Um, one of my criticisms sometimes is there does seem to be a split between the people who are striking at work or organizing at work, and then the people in the community or the users who still haven't been able to bring people together on a sort of common cost of living campaign. Food prices is a, a big issue. On the issue then, of course, linked, of course, is the housing crisis. London in particular, of course, is uh, prime investment opportunities for the mm. world. Yep. Every billionaire in the world probably has at least one expensive <laughs> house in London, if not more. Um, and also, like many other places, it's become a, an Airbnb center. Edinburgh is the same. So loads of people buy, you know, foreign and domestic investors are buying up property. And of course, this has a huge impact on those who might want to buy a house, which people do in Britain working class people or to rent is just becoming very, very difficult. And there's some very good groups. London Renters Union, for example, organizers in London. And uh, there's been some good activity, I would say. The Radical Housing Network is also campaigns in London against uh, demolition of the social housing estates and is arguing for refurbishment rather than demolition because of the climate crisis. And they're making good links with the climate campaign. So, which is, uh, it's quite good that people are making these links saying that as housing issues, we've got to link up with the environmental campaigns. Then of course there is the environmental campaign. Extinction Rebellion is, is big. Um, we have had our criticisms of them, mainly because we think they don't, bit too much calling on the government to do something mm, no. and not enough real anti-capitalist analysis or action um, and you know, there's been some stop oil again as a again a lot of direct action but there's always the problem of how do you engage you know mm. the working class in general in these campaigns and there's even a problem of a coal mine opening in one part of Britain mm. a new coal mine up in Cumbria in the Lake District 
And of course, the issue always is jobs. There's no jobs, so they want this. And then all the people who are, you know, in the same area, but maybe who are more not dependent, you know, who have jobs, then are thinking about the climate. So there's always this sort of conflict between livelihood interests and uh, environmental interests. So all that's going on. Then, of course, a lot, all of this is sort of the impact of Brexit has been huge. So what impact it's actually had on the cost of living, it has actually caused the wages to go up. So that's, but then, of course, they clock back by putting prices up, but wages have gone up because they really are shortage in the hospitality industry. They farm work, they can't get farm workers to come and, you know, so it's the usual problem. They've been dependent on cheap labor and this cheap labor is no longer there. So, so that is an issue, but it is an opportunity, I suppose, to, uh, to fight for higher wages at the same time. But uh, it's also a shame that we have lost the, the influx that we did have because we have a lot of good comrades from Eastern Europe mm. who we've met because they've come to, uh, to Britain. Oh. Um, so there's that issue. Then on the monarchy, it all sort of relates because, of course, the monarchy is, is so incredibly wealthy and it's just really quite, what's the word, just uh, such a co contrast between people suffering from the cost of living and then the amount of sheer wealth of the royal family. But unfortunately, many people are taken up by what we say is the circuses, part of bread and circuses. And uh, I think there was more support for the royal funeral than there was Charles' coronation because Queen Elizabeth was just so popular mm. and you thought people's you know, own personal relative had died. And it does make you despair a little bit when you think that so many people turned out for this and then you have a protest, you know, and you have a, yeah. a handful. Um, so we're still, but, but Charles isn't so popular. So there is potentially an avenue for doing more anti-royal stuff. We have actually written some about that in our London paper that we do with some other anarchists. And, uh, but also you can get at it through the housing and the land issue because of course they own so much land and property that there's a link to housing and, no. and the, the price of land issues. So that's going on. So probably like everywhere, I would imagine similar issues that you have. Maybe you don't have a monarchy though, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure you have some rich people. Yeah, we do, but uh, <laughs> they don't inherit it, uh, yeah. at least in the monarchi monarchical way we so if I'll add to that, because I'm particularly interested in the land issue, something I'm involved in, and it's not just the royal family, you see. There's a whole history of aristocracy that came over with the Norman Conquest uh, in 1066. So loads of land is still in the hands of the same people. So the Duke of Westminster, for example, and uh, large parts of the country are given over to grouse moors for grouse shooting, for, you know, the, uh, the rich. Yeah. So we, so we have a generally aristocracy problem. So it's not just the crown, it's the, the whole issue of, uh, of the landed aristocracy that we are trying to raise, you know, the issue about that because they also own a lot of property in the city as well. So that is particular in Scotland. And we could talk a little bit about Scotland because Scotland has probably has one of the most unequal land owning systems in the world and with a tiny number of people owning most of the land. And uh, despite the nationalist government, they're still very happy for uh, rich foreigners to come over and buy up estates. I have a good friend who works on a farm um, on an estate that's owned by a Russian oligarch. And uh, so this is just common. But in Scotland, there are campaigns now, movements for land reform. And the, the, it, there's been an increase in community buyouts which is quite positive, is this idea that the community can actually take the land. The problem is, of course, is they end up having to pay market value, even though the government might help them. So that's going on in Scotland, not in England, but there's at least some kind of awareness in Scotland and Wales to a certain extent of the inequality of land ownership.
I mean, these are all really interesting points. I mean, I didn't want to say that we don't have inheritance of wealth in Germany, but uh, at least in the regarding like monarchy, this is very different. So it's really interesting to hear this from you because, as we also touched in the podcast episode, you also have like the House of Lords, still a chamber that's mostly inherited. And um, maybe let's uh, end it with a small input of you because, as you said in the beginning, that you also have groups in Scotland and Wales. So maybe let's discuss another large crisis of the United Kingdom, the different independence movement in Scotland, Wales, and also Northern Ireland. So maybe you can just give a really short input in how anarchist communists in the United Kingdom would maybe react to this, or do they see an opportunity of like camaraderie there, or is this something that you oppose? So, up to you. So I think some individuals in Scotland supported independence, not from an ideological point of view, But when you just think that you'd had years and years and years of conservative government and you had Boris Johnson and you had this, and I think people thought, oh, what the hell, you know, it's a change, it's something different. But so more from a, I don't know, I don't know if it's practical, the word is practical. Ideologically, we are completely and firmly against nationalism. We think that the whole idea of national liberation is a complete you know, sham. Mm. That there's no way that, and, and you look at the Scottish Nationalist Party, and everyone's well aware that really, I mean, most most of it is probably sort of the, a lot of it's the Scottish bourgeois, you know, bourgeoisie, and uh, you know, industrialists, and it's a bit similar in ca to Catalonia, really. So that you have some very well-off people who support Sco Scottish nationalism. So the Scottish Nationalist Party, even though they sometimes talk sort of left, really have a, a very uh, strong current of conservatism. And even though people sort of maybe personal, I don't know, liking quite the idea of being independent from the UK and disrupting everything. I think they're well aware that this is, you know, just replacing one bourgeois government with another. And uh, But other people, I've talked to ordinary people who are anarchists, sometimes felt that they wanted independence because they're sick of talking about it. <laughs> you know, they so felt that, that there was, you know, just, oh, get it over with, for goodness sake, yeah. you know. We can move on to yeah, because, because you couldn't get on to the key <laughs> issues, you know, that, that you need to get on to because it was all divided between pro-independence or anti-independence people. So, but I don't think, you know, I don't like to be some kind of commenter on predicting the future, but I go to Scotland quite a lot, mainly for mountaineering. But, um, so I have a lot of friends there and they're not anarchists, they're not political, but a lot of them had supported the independence movement, but now I think that, that it's just lost momentum. And a lot of the people I know there now would no longer vote for independence, they just think. That. And also, you know, you, how can you just vote for independence when really it would only be about 51 or 52% of the population? And um, so I think people, a lot of people are losing interest in it, plus all the scandal in the Scottish Nationalist Party as well. But it does mean, as, as our group, that we have to be aware that really, when we're writing or doing our papers and stuff, that the situation is different and in Wales. So you've got to take into account that it's not going to be the same everywhere, which is, again, one of the advantages of having a national organization is that you can hear the perspective of the different people and make sure that you adapt a strategy to suit local conditions rather than think that one size fits all. Well, I'm really glad we had op uh, the opportunity to um, talk with you in this interview. And again, all the best to the comrades in the United Kingdom in these harsh times. And we really hope that you can make the move from the scene to an anarchist movement. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you, great, yeah.